So in this lecture, we will continue looking at building uh, materials, uh, but we will start now looking at a very important new technology used in building, plaster. Plaster is uh, thought to be the world's first pyrotechnology. And a pyrotechnology is something which changes materials using fire. Uh, plaster is the result of using fire to change the nature of a material, as is pottery. Ceramics are also a pyrotechnology, and also metals, glass, and things like that. Um, so pyrotechnology is a big leap forward in human technological uh, history, and so it's quite significant. <clears throat> So plaster and building uh, is used for mortar or decorative stucco. And it's a very important aspect of building. There are two main types. There is gypsum plaster and there is lime plaster. Gypsum plaster, also known as plaster of Paris, is from gypsum, the calcium sulfate dihydrite. So it's a calcium sulfate with water in it. At 100 to 200 degrees centigrade, this mineral loses 75% of its water. This basically becomes uh, raw plaster. You can then slake the plaster. Slake, this word right here. And in this it reabsorbs the water. Uh, it slakes readily and sets quickly in minutes. So you mix up the plaster, form it into something, and it will set very, very quickly. This is what is often used, or used to be used more commonly, for setting breaks. If you broke your leg 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you'd probably have it put in a plaster of Paris cast. However, it is soft. It absorbs water when it's set and is relatively soluble. It's commonly used for internal features or where gypsum is common but firewood resources are scarce. That would include, for example, Iraq. Lime plaster. <clears throat> Lime plaster is made of calcite originally, calcium carbonate, which of course you know well now. So this requires a lot more heat. 100, 800 to 900 degrees centigrade and you have to maintain it for a number of days. So you can imagine this takes a lot more resources. Lime, which is what is the result, uh, calcium oxide uh, is the result of uh, cooking calcite like this. It also slakes readily and it takes days to set. So they take a long time to wait for your leg to mend if uh, you put a cast of lime plaster. <clears throat> so here is a lime burner's kiln from Hans Wolf's book. And so you can see it's just a big, in this case, structure in which you throw in limestone and fuel and lime comes out. This is quite an interesting uh, example of a lime kiln. It's from Rome, the Cryptobalbi, and this was found in excavations from the 8th, 9th century AD. And what was particularly interesting was their source of, of the uh, calcite, which was marble statu statuary. There's, there were lots of bits of very nice statues, which they were about to throw into their lime kiln. This is a lime kiln at the monastery where I was working at Tir Marmuza in Syria. And you can see that it's been turned white. This is, um, so these are all limestone blocks. All the hills here are made of limestone. And the heat, the fire was inside, the, the, the raw limestone and the fuel and it's turned the blocks of the lime kiln white, it's turned to two lime and heated it. You can see it's turning red as well. And so all the lime that was inside 
has been taken away and used for plastering the walls of the monastery. Plastered skulls are a very interesting thing from a number of places like Jericho, Ein Ghazal, um, and other places in uh, further north. What this is from the pre pottery Neolithic period, and what they did in these times, they used plaster a lot. We coming up in the next lecture when we're talking a bit about the architecture of this period. Uh, they used plaster on the insides of their houses and the outside of their houses. Um, when certain people died, doesn't seem to be so for all of the community, but uh, possibly when respected members of the community died, they were often buried under the floor of the houses. And so they would make a hole in the floor and dig a hole, dig a, a pit and put the body of the deceased in it and fill it in again and cover the floor with plaster again. Sometime later, there they would then dig a hole where the head was and extract the skull, then fill in the hole again and put plaster down again. So then they would have the skull and they would cover it with plaster. These are a rare example of a uh, three plaster skull that seem to be in an original context. So the skull underneath has been basically had its face recreated using plaster. This is a lime plaster, so we're taking some resources to create. This is one at the ROM. Um, so if you manage to get into the ROM, you'll be able to see this very important artifact. If you look closely, you can see the, the, the maxilla of the skull underneath, and over that is all this plaster. And here is the cranium. So you can see it's a, a mature but not completely fused uh, joints in the skull here. And it also seems to be a female. At Ein Ghazal and uh, at other places, they, they also found uh, these figures made of plaster, which were also very interesting, um, some of which had two heads. So at Chatelhoyuk, of course, remember, they also loved plaster. And so the insides and the outsides were covered with plaster and they created all these weird things out of plaster. They plastered and painted the walls and archaeologists have uh, thin sectioned the walls. And so you can see it's made up of layers of plaster. And so this is just a uh, whitewash, which is a lime plaster paint, very thin plaster. And so it would build up with soot and then get painted white. And so this would happen quite regularly, as you can see. Here we can see a plasterer plastering a wall. It's wood with laths, and then it's being plastered. And here he is smoothing it with a piece of wood, much to the amusement of his apprentice. And here we have stucco. Stucco is carved plaster very big thing in Iran going back some time uh, which will be the subject of a future lecture but uh, as you can see this is in Iran this is actually in Isfahan and uh, you can see plaster is a big thing this is the Yemen where they also went into plaster in a big way here they had fired brick architecture and then plastered the interior and of course, if you add sand to it, it will make a useful mortar. And so here in Iran, they're building this brick building and sending up uh, these containers filled with plaster. See, they're mixing it here, their shovels, they're pouring water onto it to slake it and then carrying it up to use as mortar to lay the bricks. 
So that brings us <clears throat> to bricks. So before bricks, there was pizze. Uh, and what this is, is basically you make mud and you put it on a foundation and just build it up. And so you can't build an entire wall all in one go. So what they would do was build it up to a certain height and they would build it up all the way along here and then do another layer. This rather old photograph, see it's a bit dusty, um, is an excellent example of showing how Pizze is built up because it's weathering away. And so you can see these lines where the layers of Pizze were deposited and then had another layer put on top of it. So it's very simple, very effective. See, this is not a very old building, otherwise it would have just melted away. And so it's still a technology which continues until recent times. But then we get bricks. This is a very early big brick from the pre-pottery Neolithic A. Um, so very early, before pottery. And so they would make these bricks like you might make a loaf of bread. And in fact, here are their thumbprints in it. Here are my thumbs to show you how it worked. This is actually at the ROM, the ROM supported excavations at Jericho, Tel Al Sultan, um, back in the 50s, I think it was. So at Jericho, they were very keen on architecture. Um, very interesting stone tower. And a lot of mud brick, of course. So for making bricks, again, just like for making pizza, you prepare the loam, the mud. Uh, you might be wanting to slake the clay, make the clay wet and sieve it. And eventually they develop the idea of having a mold. And so in this, you just slap the clay into the mold and whack the mold onto the ground and the bricks come out. And so you get all of these bricks laying out in the sun to dry. And so these are sun dried bricks, unfired. So if you put them in a bucket of water, they would turn back to mud. However, um, they're a very abundant material and very effective material. And so they're still used to this day and there's no reason why not. Uh, you can build things with them. Inside it's very cool because you have this thick layer of mud between you and the sun. So they work very well. These are some uh, buildings I saw in the Syrian desert on the one way to, to Tadmor Palmyra one time. They've been abandoned, but you can see how they've been built up out of unfired mud brick. And, and this is the art shop. I quite like this picture. So mud brick, as I say, can just turn back into mud. So that's basically what can happen once it's abandoned. So here we have mud brick buildings. You can see layers of mud brick and it's been covered with mud plaster. In some cases it might be whitewashed to make it stronger. This looks a bit whitewashed with a slightly different shade. Um, but eventually if it's not um, maintained, particularly on the top and the bottom, uh, then it'll start to break down. The bottom you often get wind blowing sand and breaking away at it and, and so you you start to get it collapsing from down here. Here we can see the foundation. So this may be all you find in an excavation is a, a row of stones where the mud brick walls were on top. You can see here a wooden frame around the doorway. You can see here more mud brick collapsing. And so you need wood probably layers of uh, matting, reed matting or something like that. And then you'd put more mud on the top for the roof. 
So mud bricks is what makes these things. This is a tell. A tell, which is Arabic for things that look like this. And what makes these is mud bricks. Because unlike fired bricks, once your house is falls down, it's really not practical to reuse the bricks. And so it just turns into dirt and you just level the dirt and put fresh buildings on it with fresh mud bricks you've made, probably down here in the plain somewhere. And it builds up on these layers. So that's what makes these features. So then we get to fired bricks. This is an open brick kiln. Basically what you're seeing here are the bricks which are being fired with the heat underneath. And you also get closed brick kilns where you take in all the bricks and you cook them inside and Bob's your uncle. So the thing about firing is the same as it is with pottery. And you have clay minerals in the brick. And if you remember, this is a phyllosilicate. And in this phyllosilicate is water. And when you fire a phyllosilicate, you destroy it. And so the clay is destroyed. Subsequently, oh yeah, water. Subsequently, this brick is basically going to be a brick forever. You can't turn it back into mud. Even if you ground it down, it would turn into dust, which you can get wet, but it'll never be clay again. So you can't recycle it. So it might be reworked. So this guy is trimming the edge to make it a right shape to fit somewhere. It's like working stone, only quite a soft stone. This is uh, a very important brick building. This is the uh, Taki Khazra or the Palace of Khuzral, um, which was probably built in about the 6th century AD and is uh, quite near Baghdad, at Ctesiphon, or very near to Ctesiphon. And here they're rebuilding it a bit. But this is this was all that was left. Very important uh, building, which I'll mention a bit more about later on. So, of course, fired brick laid in courses. Very important in Iran. Here we have more Iranian bricks. This is uh, depicting a ruin and you can see the bricks were covered with tiles because no one really likes the look of bricks in his time. So the Pantheon, um, very important, made of bricks and also concrete. So concrete is also related to plaster. It's uh, basically closely related to a lime plaster, but it's filled with other stuff. And so there's lots of words around concrete, um, typically Latin words, since they are very keen on concrete, the Romans. Cement, cementum, means rough stone or chipping. And of course, it's filled with them. Concretus means grown together or compounded. And so... What happens is the, uh, the matrix here is essentially lime plaster or something closely related to it. And by compounding it together, it, it has its own support from the stones and the sand within it. And because of the, the, the materials within it, it will create a different chemical uh, structure when the crystals grow within the matrix. If you uh, create a pozzolanic cement using volcanic sand from Pozzoli, um, this will maintain, make an even stronger material. And there are actually uh, sources of uh, related material like ash, which also greatly uh, improved the quality of the concrete. And so Roman concrete it's still a bit of a mystery, people are researching it, exactly how they made it. And there's probably a bit of uh, witchcraft going on in here of adding a bit of this and adding a bit of that to make something that has lasted for thousands of years. Well, 
2,000 years anyway. And so here we have this big concrete building. It's actually a lot more attractive than that sounds, but uh, it's quite, quite an impressive structure. So how they worked this was they would build the brick part on the inside and the outside and then fill it with concrete. And they have these arches, which show up better here, in order to support the weight of this massive dome on the top, which was uh, pretty impressive in its day. So that's our introduction to pyrotechnology. And with these advances in uh, technology, like bricks, fired bricks and plaster, we can then go on to more building in the next lecture. Thank you.